Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, perhaps, wherever you are currently uh, on the world. We are we are happy to have you on board on, on a very exciting day, uh, not only because of the topic that we will be discussing today, but also because of the uh, current state of the uh, American elections, as I think most of us are, uh, are monitoring, monitoring them uh, right now. Uh, welcome, welcome to this webinar uh, by Southpaw and Gaia on, on climate risk and data. Uh, we really have a, a great list of speakers today, uh, both on DFIs as well as international organizations and networks. Um, the Nordic Platform for Mobilizing Climate Finance is a network of Nordic uh, investors and companies that uh, want to share their thoughts and experiences uh, on different climate-related uh, topics. And that is what this platform uh, really unifies. So uh, this is actually our last webinar. We've held about six in the recent weeks. Uh, so we're happy uh, to see that you are joining and happy to see the uh, rising number of attendees as well. Uh, just a few uh, housekeeping notes before we uh, go into the program and I'll uh, introduce the speakers. Uh, so you, you, once you've joined, you're automatically muted. However, uh, your voice uh, will be heard. And we're happy to hear your voice because that is what this is all about uh, to uh, not only be uh, transmitting information, but to be receiving it from you. So in the panel, you can see a question box. And at any time, please feel free to submit this question. And we will not uh, use name or company. We will only use uh, the question for input for the discussion. So there's a team of people uh, registering them. So again, feel free to contribute to the dialogue with us. I am broadcasting from uh, my home. Some of the speakers are as well. Uh, forgive us for any uh, accidental cat or accidental mailman that uh, uh, would uh, be standing in front of the door. Uh, so uh, uncontrollable, unfortunately. The webinar will be recorded and we will share the slide deck uh, with all those who have registered and attended as well. For your reference, uh, we'll do our best to uh, uh, end the program before 11.30 today. And for more information, you can click on the landing page of our platform. Good, a few words about South Pole. So South Pole is a, a global uh, climate sustainability firm uh, originated in 2006. As you can see, we're spread around the globe and we're uh, helping both corporates, investors, as well as NGOs, governments on uh, the, the topic of climate uh, through different uh, means. It could be through data uh, insights, uh, but you might have uh, heard of us as well as being uh, one of the largest provider of uh, carbon emission reduction projects globally. So the route to net zero. Uh, just a few words about uh, sustainable finance at South Pole, uh, TCFD, which will be uh, spoken about uh, with a few uh, presenters today. This is something that is our uh, main service. Uh, we help investors uh, getting the data insights into setting up such a report uh, and do the uh, necessary gap analysis or hand holding here, physical and transition risks, uh, but also uh, services that uh, align with the new uh, European. Um, sustainable finance efforts such as uh, aligning portfolios with the taxonomy. We work with SDG impacts and wider net zero commitments as well. Miko, may I give the word to you to say a few words about Gaia, co-organizer? Thank you. Good morning to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to host this uh, webinar series together with uh, South Pole and, and Ingmar. Uh, my name is uh, Mikko Halonen. I come from Gaia. I'm a partner at Gaia and we've been working for the past 25 years or so with sustainability globally in various parts of the world. Next slide, please, Ingmar. So, so uh, just a few words about Gaia before entering the topic. We've been working with, with uh, governments, NGOs, academia, research, businesses, the finance sector, to find end-to-end -end concrete practical solutions to our most pressing sustainability challenges. And for the past 20 years, we've had the pleasure to work with Nordic governments in particular to see whether and how the Nordic uh, countries could provide the leadership that is expected from them. If there's some particular value add that the Nordics can deliver. And one of the areas is definitely where 
uh, is about finance. So is there something that the Nordics could uh, share on their experience with mobilizing private climate finance and more broadly green the uh, finance sector as such. So it's a great pleasure to host this webinar series together with uh, with South Pole. We have great speakers uh, also ready today. So without further ado, uh, back to Ingmar. I'm looking forward to a really fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Miko. A few words about the platform. Uh, so the platform uh, is inspired by the Nordic uh, 2030 vision by uh, the recently established Helsinki principles, and it is supported by the Nordic Council of Ministers, and then also specifically a working group in there, which is called NKL, the Nordic Working Group of Climate and Air. As you can see on this slide, uh, all the Nordic countries are involved, and you can see a, a a general taste of uh, the investors that uh, we have on board and uh, that have been speaking uh, throughout the course of the webinars. So, uh, yes, the speakers getting to the program. Uh, may I ask everybody just to open his or her camera? Unfortunately, we were not able to uh, uh, manage the uh, te te technical difficulties uh, for, uh, for Isabel, but Isabel is happy to see you all and, and very happy to be here on board. So I think uh, we should be able to see everybody now. Um, so we have our first speaker of today, which is uh, Dr. Nico Kroene. He's a climate scientist, our lead climate scientist and senior manager at South Pole. Maybe Nico, if you could wave to the audience for a moment. Uh, we have Martin Skanke, the chairman of the PRI on board as well. Welcome, Martin. And then we have Isabel. Program Manager at NDF. There is Ola Navstad, the Chief Economist of North Fund. So today we'll be guiding you through a program where Nico will be uh, saying first, we will set the scene on climate risk and how Southfold perceives it, works with investors on it and its approach. Martin will say a bit more about uh, the new TCFD report and how the PRI as instruments and uh, sources ready for investors to consult. Isabel and Ola will both represent the, the Nordic Development Finance Institution perspective and, and will tell us more about uh, climate and portfolios and on the ground experiences. Nico, may I give the word to you to kick off with the first presentation? Sure, thank you, Ingmar, <clears throat> and also welcome. From my side to everybody, uh, we're looking forward to this webinar and uh, and the fruitful discussion, and also looking forward to the presentations of the other speakers. So I don't will not take you or keep you too long, but I think it's just good to have a general introduction into uh, climate risk and data, and what do we mean by it, and how can we in generally uh, address this topic. Um, one thing that is really important, and of course, it all, all um, immediately comes to mind if we speak about climate risk and climate data, is TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, which provide a framework in which to embed climate risk uh, analysis. And of course, not only about climate risk, but also about climate opportunities. And if we speak about um, these, uh, this topic of climate risk and, and climate data, it's important to really um, see the, uh, the framework it's embedded in and the way we at South Pole seeing it. And it's really important at the beginning of such a journey to addressing uh, these risk opportunities to know where you are. Uh, so this type of a gap analysis to really understand where are you in the process um, and where are the gaps within the reporting, but also with the availability of data and so forth. Then, of course, the next step and important step uh, is the climate scenario analysis itself. One of the big and important steps forward that TCFD made to really put an emphasis of, on scenario analysis. And here, uh, of course, Southpool can, can support as well. And I will speak a bit more in details about uh, climate scenario analysis in the next uh, five to 10 minutes. Then, uh, let's say we, uh, we have done the scenario analysis. Of course, it's really important to also be able to integrate whatever you got out of the scenario analysis into the internal uh, risk management processes. And here, um, we also 
kind of work with the clients to make sure that the, the data is really integrated and in the right uh, moment and the right uh, and is available for the right people to make uh, useful decisions with it. And finally, of course, you also want to report about the, the things that you do. And then uh, there is the TCFD aligned disclosure is an important part where we help drafting this type of uh, analysis. Of for today, I don't want to speak too much of TCFD. I think everybody there has so many webinars already speaking about it. So I want to go a bit more into the details on, on scenario analysis and how you can address um, scenario analysis in a bit more detail. Um, so if you go one slide forward, you see exactly my, my focus will be the climate scenarios. And if we speak about climate scenarios, something that comes into mind immediately is these large uncertainties, right? We're all struggling with it. There are really large uncertainties. If you look into the future, even if you use scenarios, there will be lots of uncertainties accumulating over the assessment process. This is just one example from the IPCC, the cascade of uncertainties for physical risk, where you kind of start with how does the future society look like? What are the greenhouse gas emissions? Then we start to go into the details of climate models, then how you do how you regionalize these uh, these data, how do you get to an impact, how do you make this impact local, and then finally, what will be the adaptation responses. And this large uh, envelope of uncertainty, of course, uh, makes it uh, difficult to come to really uh, stringent uh, results in the end. However, we believe, given these uncertainties, there is a way of, of tackling them by following a really a consistent framework as well as a consistent process. So it's not just about data, but it's also about having the right processes in place. So Ingmar, if you go one step forward. When I speak about a consistent framework, I think this is also something that is probably familiar to most of you, it comes from the insurance world a bit. The IPCC also adopted this type of a framework, which speaks about uh, three important parts if you want to uh, identify risk and its impact. And this is to find the exposure, which merely means mapping whatever projects uh, you're invested in, mapping the operations of companies you're invested in, and even looking at the supply chain. So going really into deep into the supply chains, really get a feeling of the full uh, exposure uh, towards uh, climate risks and their opportunities. Then of course, there is the hazard, any natural hazard related to, to climate, heat waves, heavy precipitation, but of course also um, uh, hazards that are related to our economy kind of transition into a low carbon economy, being at different policies and so forth introduced. I don't want to spend too much time on physical versus transition risk. I think it has been explained quite quite often already. But then if you if you think about how these hazards are are impacting um, a company or then finally your portfolios, of course vulnerability is one important part as well. So even if there is a heat wave, if there is a new policy, what does it actually mean? How strong is this impact? And this is uh, covered by the vulnerability. Taking these three components together, uh, you are able to start to quantify climate risks. And of course, doing that, there's still kind of several steps you have to go through to kind of really identify these three components. And this I would like to, to show on the next slide, which is uh, our three-step approach to climate risk assessment. And for me, really important here is one thing that I would like to stress, and it sometimes gets a bit lost because everybody is just thinking about scenarios, is that you you need a good baseline. You need a good baseline as assessment and a good best baseline understanding of the current day exposure, the current day risk, the current day natural hazards affecting you to be able to then really go into the future uh, and do some meaningful assessments. If you're starting from an uncertain baseline, then no matter how good the scenario is, you will end up with not really uh, strong results in the end. So this is why we really start with the baseline assessment, go then into the scenario analysis, and then finally going into the, into the financial impacts. And here it really depends, and I will come to that a bit later also when we come to the conclusions, but I think here it really depends on the exact analysis that you do on where we think how much detail uh, is achievable on the financial impacts. So I'm not, I'm not a big fan of just putting a really re, a kind of uncertain number on, on, on something just to have a number there. I think sometimes it's better to stay then on a, on a higher level and be more qualitative in the, in the results, but just appreciate um, the uncertainties that, that have been incorporated in the analysis. Before we move on, one important thing I would really like to also to stress is this whole thing is not just something 
somebody else is doing, right? And there is just a data dump towards uh, an organization, but really through the whole process, it's really important to have an engagement because only if also the internal stakeholders kind of are going along on this journey, there is the possibility that this data is used. And I think also just you need to get all the knowledge that is already in most of the companies hidden sometimes somewhere in different silos and different uh, parts of the organization. You need to get this information into this process to really make it useful in the end. Um, so if we continue one more uh, sliding, please. Um, just wanted to have a quick discussion on data sources and tools, right? So far it was uh, relatively high level, but of course there is a crazy amount of data uh, available uh, and for all of these different factors that finally go into a climate risk and opportunities assessment. So if we if we look at the hazard and then if we look at the baseline assessment, there are lots of different data sources. I just name a few error five. There are national uh, risk inventories that are available in terms of natural hazard. There are um, data sources on current policies available. Um, I think one important thing to discriminate if you speak about hazard or to separate between the hazard is for transition risk, there are lots of different scenarios that you can choose from. There is the IEA, there is the NGFS scenarios, there's the SSP scenarios, a lot of different scenarios. For the physical risk on the other side, there are much less scenarios. They're just the IPCC scenarios. The RCPs, they are there and there's not too much difference in the uh, kind of other scenarios that you can choose. But for the physical risk, it's then the next step, kind of the resolution, which type of data do I use for the different hazards? Not really the scenario, but really this type of data. Do I use CMAP5, so the global climate models? Do I use specific indices like the EC ETCDI indices? Or do I engage with a data platform like Copernicus to get better data. I mean, there are lots of different uh, possibilities uh, here to, to get a good view on the hazard. And if you speak about the vulnerability, again, uh, there is a bit of difference between transition and physical risks. If we speak about physical risks, there are data platforms like OASIS, which is a, a MOS modeling framework. Um, there are, of course, private sector uh, databases, so all the reinsurance companies have often relatively good information available. Sometimes they are behind the paywall, but uh, nevertheless, some good information is available there. Then it's really important for both sides to get project specific impacts. So there's also something that we see when we work with corporates, for example, often the corporates themselves has really good information already available. What are the important thresholds in terms of climate risk impacts? Um, that you that you need to look at. And then of course, also on transition risk side, if you look about scientific papers, information from the World Bank, um, in terms of price elasticities uh, and, and other information that is useful to understand how vulnerable, for example, are you to a potential carbon uh, price in the future. And finally, um, the exposure data, something that's also discussed quite often is asset level information, right? So there is often within the within the different organizations, you already have really good uh, internal data sets. Sometimes it's not possible to share them because of, of privacy or confidentiality issues. Um, but however, one needs to make sure that this, this, this data is somehow accounted for because it's often uh, relatively strong. It's tested by you, so uh, make use of it. Of course, then there's a pot potential to buy data sources from different uh, data providers. Often there are also kind of sector inventories that can be used or even uh, public information. What I would like to say here is it's important to keep in mind that whatever data source you use, you have to be a connection between hazard vulnerability and exposure. It doesn't make sense to buy like a huge data set on as level information for lots and spend lots of money on it if you're not able to connect it to a, to a really good vulnerability and hazard data set as well. Otherwise, uh, you kind of lose uh, information and spend money on something that maybe is not, not so useful as it could be. With that, and also saying that I'm really looking forward to the, uh, to the presentation that come after, um, I would like to come to some conclusions. Um, to wrap up this, this, this short introduction, and um, kind of from our experience, really what we can say is get started with this process and facilitate an iterative process. Really just, just get started, go through the cycle once, do the baseline, do the scenario, do the, do the quantification of the financial impacts. And then based on this uh, information, this experience, start anew. Uh, in, incorporating, of course, what you have done before, but then kind of uh, go into more details wherever it's needed. For example, on based on the mortality that you identified in the first go. It's really important. There's no size 
that fits it all, right? So it really depends on what you want to do. There is no, I just use this one um, score and then I'm, I'm, I'm settled with everything. You really have to be, look out what you want to do in terms of your, in, your internal management of the disclosure and so forth to choose the right data sets um, to be used. Then, as I as stressed before, use a collaborative approach. Really engage with the different internal stakeholders to make sure all the experience and knowledge from within is really used in the in this project. Um, then something that we I think also heard relatively often so far was don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So really, as said before, get started uh, even if it's not like the, the analysis that goes in all the detail and covers like every every asset class and every investment, uh, that's not that's not an issue. Um, what, what I would like to add here is don't try to do too much too quickly because don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good doesn't mean you should go and put a financial number on everything and say, yeah, it's maybe just a rough number, but at least we have a number. I think that can be really dangerous sometimes. So, I mean, we can speak about it later. We, Southpaw is also part of a, of an um, initiative in Australia where different stakeholders come together to improve the, the reporting and, and the assessment itself for climate risk opportunities. And one of the important topics here is also don't go too far too quickly because if you start to do uh, putting financial numbers on, on things that are too uncertain, you are in risk to, uh, to really go in the wrong direction. Um, and with that, I hope we can come back to some of these conclusions during the discussion and looking forward to the other um, presentations. And Thanks, over Nico. To Thank you. Thank you for the presentation and the quick flight through a uh, climate risk hazard, vulnerability, exposure. Focus on the baseline first. Uh, don't uh, consider just a data dump from A to B, but bespoke work uh, looking at different data sources. Uh, an unstandardized market, no size fits all, but start and start in a small manner, perhaps focusing on one portfolio or a particular geographic region. Great start for uh, uh, the rest of the discussion. And I see we have some questions coming in, but let's let's pause them for uh, after a few more presentations. Martin, may I give the word to you to give us an update on, uh, on your perspective, TCFD? Thank you. Great, thank you. And thanks to Nico for uh, a good introduction. So um, just start with the first uh, slide. Just uh, I suspect that many of you are PRI signatories, but uh, in any case, and you know about the PRI, but uh, in any case, a quick update. We're now over 3,300 signatories. Uh, so um, we're really uh, growing and we're happy to be serving our signatories. Uh, we ask our signatories every year what they want us to focus on and for the last few years climate change has been on top of that list so uh, that's a very solid reason for why we try to do more in this area now so uh, what i wanted to do today was just quickly go through some updates from tcft activities i've been on this task force since it was established uh, and also uh, just a couple of words on pri activities to support our signatories in implementing the tcft recommendations um, so if we start with the next slide, please. Um, so this is, and you'll be hopefully be familiar with this um, uh, setup. The, this is the TCFT on one page, the 11 questions in the four categories that constitute the TCFT reporting framework. So the original um, or the, the advice from the TCFT was that every uh, company should disclose uh, the questions, the five questions that are in the first and third columns, so governance and risk management. These are very sort of descriptive, high-level questions around a strategy, governance, risk management processes. Uh, this should be doable for everyone. I think the tricky part is the questions on strategy and metrics and targets. Um, and as you will see, that's why we also came up now with some more guidance uh, around that. Uh, and in particular, the, the tricky question, I think, was the third question under strategy, which says, describe the resilience of the organization's strategy, taking into consideration different climate-related scenarios, including a two-degree or lower scenario. And this is really, I think, the, the question where the TCFD framework is very different from a lot of the other frameworks that deal with climate. 
think a lot of the other frameworks have dealt with climate from the accountability perspective, thinking about how you can hold companies accountable for climate change through their emissions. So the focus has been very much how companies affect the climate through their emissions. Uh, the TCFT's focus was really more on the risk perspective. So not on how companies affect the climate, but on how climate change and climate policies can affect companies financially. And the stress test was designed to answer that question. And that would give investors valuable input to understand risks to partic particular strategies, particular companies, and then feed into engagement um, processes around capital structure, dividend policy, investment plans, et cetera. So that this is sort of, I, I really see this third question under strategy as really the core uh, of, uh, of the TCFD. And uh, if we want to make progress on you know, uh, the climate issue, investors need to understand these issues. They need to understand the resilience of different business models in this transition to a low carbon economy. So it's important for me to stress that the TCFD is not about reporting for its own sake. It's reporting for a purpose. It's reporting around something that can be uh, an input into a meaningful discussion between investors and the companies they've invested in. And I think that is really, really important that it's not, that the report is not sort of a glossy, you know, end product and then you're just finished with it, but it's part of an ongoing process. So that perspective is really, really important. Uh, next, please. Um, this is, uh, I'm not going to go through this, but uh, there is a lot of momentum also through uh, regulatory change. And this slide is really just for your uh, reference. And I'm sure you'll get the slides afterwards if you haven't gotten them already. So um, this is just uh, a little update for you. Um, next, please. Um, so uh, last week, the TCFT published what has now become sort of a yearly status uh, report, the 2020 status report, trying to look at how implementation of the principles is progressing. And I think the short answer is that we're progressing. Uh, so that's the good news. But the bad news is that it's not really going fast enough. So when we saw these results and, uh, you know, we we're discussing over the last year, we thought, okay, let's, we try to, we, we wanted to do something which is sort of helpful and trying to encourage more uh, disclosures and trying to give more guidance. Um, so I'll come back to that uh, in a, in a, sorry, next please. And this is what we uh, came up with. So we've, um, in addition to the status report, uh, we, uh, publish three, let's call them more forward-looking documents. So one is a guidance on uh, how to conduct these climate-related scenario analysis, covering some of the topics that Nico mentioned. Um, and so the TCFD tries to come up with some, some guidance that can help uh, companies uh, do this exercise. Uh, secondly, uh, we uh, there is a document uh, on how to integrate risk management, sorry, climate related risk into risk management processes, and then a consultation document on forward looking metrics for the financial sector. So the, these forward looking metrics are things like implied warming metrics and others that companies or particularly investors are now using to sort of communicate around uh, climate risks in their portfolios. Uh, we didn't come far enough on that in that work to be able to issue some recommendations, but we have a consultation document and we will then uh, use that as a basis for hopefully developing some recommendations next year. Uh, so if we take the next slide, please. Um, I'll actually skip, I mean, Nico went through a lot of this, but the scenario guidance is about sort of main principles for constructing good scenarios. And there's a lot of, sort of some case studies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, thinking about what, are, what is the useful range of scenarios. Uh, so hopefully this uh, will be very uh, useful and can encourage more reporting on this question uh, C under uh, strategy in the TCFD framework. Uh, next, please. Uh, so on the risk management side, um, this is something that uh, we wanted to come up with some more guidance around because 
it is important that we recognize that there are some specific characteristics of climate change uh, that are listed here also around, uh, you know, uh, the, the time horizon, for instance, uh, the novel, the sort of the new nature uh, of this uh, and, and the complexities, the nonlinear relationships, etc. So yes, climate risks are different, but climate risks from a company corporate perspective need to be managed in a coherent process with other types of risks. You can't have uh, climate risk management as sort of a sideshow. You need to try to integrate it into your normal risk management processes. So that's why we thought it would be useful to come up with guidance on how you can take these climate risk factors in, and acknowledging that they are in many ways different, but at the same time using a or fitting them into a more standardized risk management framework and seeing how they're linked to all the other types of risks that businesses are facing. Uh, so this is really the, the new documents from the TCFD and uh, they were published last week. Uh, I encourage you to go to the TCFD website, and, uh, download them and read them and I hope you'll find them useful. If we can go to the next slide, I, I'll just say a couple of words now on what the PRI is doing to uh, help our signatories uh, make sense of all of this. So um, firstly, of course, uh, reducing information barriers. We know that our signatories are constrained in terms of resources and time. So what we try to do is issue some technical guidance, uh, case studies, uh, we do webinars and other activities just to help our signatories navigate through all of this. Um, secondly, uh, collaboration. Uh, and this feeds directly into sort of the use of the TCFD for engagement, because I think uh, we need to recognize the, the crucial role of investors in this energy transition process. Uh, the role of investors in the market economy is to allocate capital, and we need to make sure that when we make those decisions on capital allocation, be it a lending decision, investments in equity, discussions on capital structure, on dividend policies, that we understand also climate risk as part of that investment uh, issue. Uh, and the Climate Action 100 Plus is uh, a very good example of how investors can collaborate. We now have more than 500 investors on this platform, um, engaging with the 161 companies in the world with the highest CO2 emissions. Uh, they constitute about 80% of total emissions from the industrial sector globally. And we engage with them on issues of climate risk reporting, climate risk management, transition strategies, um, um, et cetera, emissions trajectories. So uh, this is, I think, a very, uh, is proved to be very successful, I think. I'm very encouraged by the early results. This is a five-year program. Uh, so it's still early days, but still uh, I find the progress there very, very encouraging. And I think it just demonstrates that climate risk reporting, TCFD reporting, is not about reporting for the sake of reporting, but that it is reporting that is used for something. And, and the TCFD reporting is really the basis for a lot of the engagements under Climate Action 100 Plus, which is investors engaging with companies on transition strategies and risk management, using TCFD reporting as a basis for that engagement. Finally, um, reporting to the PRI because we in as you if you're signatories you know that we ask you as signatories to report to us every year on on your activities and we've included some uh, TCFD related questions in the reporting framework. Uh, this is useful because it gives us a snapshot of what investors are actually doing uh, and it is also a basis for us to come up come back to investors with good practice guidance based on actual investor practices. Uh, so if you take the next slide, um, uh, now we've included some of these uh, uh, as mandatory. Uh, so we have over 2,000 responses now for the last reporting for this year. Um, so this is extremely useful, I think, and it allows us to come back to our signatories with much more uh, uh, guidance around how you can actually implement this. 
Uh, but okay, there are 2,000 uh, uh, signatories reporting on some of this, but if you take the, the next slide, which is the final slide, um, obviously there are big differences between our signatories with respect to the quality of this reporting. Um, so we have this sort of staircase uh, where you start at the bottom level is sort of awareness, meaning you are aware and you can demonstrate and you sort of in uh, in your private reporting to the PRI, uh, you can demonstrate that you are aware and that you have at least a minimum of activities around you know climate risk management. Um, then we have uh, an additional group which has. Uh, uh, done some attempts at least on scenario analysis and can, can document that. Um, the next uh, step on this ladder is what we call sort of responsible uh, investors. Um, so they have a publicly available response, they've done the scenario analysis and they discuss the results of that analysis and then sort of the top level what we call strategic is um, sort of a uh, even deeper in, uh, embedded into the whole strategy and uh, planning of the organization in a public way. So um, we need to work along both dimensions. We want to work, of course, on the breadth of reporting, getting more signatories to report and more companies to report, but also the depth of reporting and getting, you know, gradually improving the quality uh, of reporting. And uh, we hope that through the guidance that we issued that we're able to help our investors go deeper into this. But I should say, finally, it's not about reporting for the sake of reporting. It is because we think that you can actually make better decisions, better investment decisions and be a better investor if you manage these risks in a good way. Uh, and, and that is really the core uh, of this. So uh, thank you back to you, Ingmar. Thanks so much, Martin. Uh, steadily increase in uptake of peer of um, uh, TCFT uh, globally. It's not about reporting, it's about the purpose, perhaps also further integration, board level expertise on the topic. Um, climate risks need to be managed just like other risk factors and some great PRI resources that our uh, listeners today can uh, consult when we uh, share the slide deck. I see, uh, Miko, there are some questions coming in. Could you could you select one for uh, for Martin before we go to a small break? Thank you, Ingmar, and thank you, Martin. Uh, there is one question asking about how much is risk assessment a uh, financial sector issue and how much do industrial companies or smaller size companies come into the question? Is it the yin-yang relationship or is one or the other encouraging and catalyzing and pushing the other? How, how does it work? Yeah, uh, so excellent uh, question. I would say that, um, you know, the interaction between institutional investors and corporates are really with the listed corporates and by definition, so those are the larger ones. I think for the smaller and medium sized companies that don't have large institutional owners, they don't necessarily get this pressure from their investors. Um, but uh, many of them, and particularly I would say in, in the Nordics, uh, where there are, uh, you know, very, usually very strong relations between the small, medium sized companies and their banks. Um, we see that banks are stepping up their efforts, not so much as investors, but as lenders um, and, and guiding uh the small and medium sized uh companies on the climate risk issues particularly you know transition risk issues um and i know that that is true for several of the nordic banks uh so i think that's we we, we shouldn't only talk about you know the huge global investors and the large corporates but also thinking about the small and medium sized businesses and for them i think the banking relation is much more important than uh, the sort of investor uh, relation. Many of these companies are family owned also, so there aren't really many outside investors, but there's always sort of this link to the banking sector. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for answering that one, Martin, and for uh, picking it, Miko. Let's move on to a, a quick break uh, for everybody. And uh, I just want to highlight here uh, one of the main 
you know, struggles or questions we want to uh, address today is that looking at what Nico presented, what Martin presented, the uncertainty among uh, climate risk data and potentially the need for further standardization or guidance to the sector, um, would there be a role then for uh, governments in facilitating uh, high quality uh, climate risk data that is actually also fit for uh, investment decision making? And we've asked this question to you prior to uh, registering for the webinar. And um, although we got a, a relatively small amount of answers, uh, 14 in total, all of them were uh, positive on uh, the potential role for Nordic governments or governments in, in general to to take a role here in this in this field. And just some examples as we, we saw, absolutely this would help the financial sector, <clears throat> sorry, integrate uh, climate risk and, and agree on data and language. Uh, analogy was made with uh, the, the recent uh, EU taxonomy. We saw um, that this could help increase Nordic climate science and policy interface and further stimulate collaboration. And it could help to ensure a, a level playing field in terms of access to the same uh, climate risk data. So uh, consider this a challenge to you before we go to uh, the other two speakers of today's webinar and particularly a question. So if we here accept that, yes, there is a role, uh, what could this role be? And, and please help us out by submitting your idea through the question box so we can take it with us to the end of the webinar uh, during which we will together with all the speakers address this question and any other questions that come in from you. So again, once more, according to you, is there a role for governments or Nordic governments to facilitate climate risk data for investment decision making? Should this be in a multi-stakeholder setting? Could governments publish position papers or formal recommendations, law? Just some ideas. Happy to hear your input. Good. May I then ask Ola to open your camera and that we continue with uh, the third presentation of today. Ola, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been asked to make a brief introduction of Northern and what we do, particularly in the uh, areas that are relevant to the climate issues. Uh, so I will start with the uh, inform about our our mission and how we work and then we'll go into the more climate related uh, areas so uh, next slide uh, northern is uh, a development uh, finance institution at dfi uh, uh, making commercial investments in companies in developing countries. We are a part of Norwegian development aid uh, policy area. And uh, our and we have a pure development mandate, and that's to create job and improve lives uh, by investing in businesses that drive sustainable development. And as energy is a crucial driver for development, uh, we put a lot of emphasis on investments in energy. And we are also mandated to invest 50% of all the capital that are allocated from the government in renewable energy projects. Next slide. Uh, Northern invests uh, in four areas uh, where clean energy is by far the largest. Half of our portfolio are invested in clean energy but also financial institutions, banks and microfinance are a large uh, uh, investment area constituting approximately 30% of our portfolio. So energy and uh, financial institutions investments uh, constitute 80%. And we have quite recently introduced green infrastructure, uh, such as waste management uh, and related uh, areas as an investment uh, area we haven't done any investment in that area so far but uh, but we are working on building a pipeline in that and then we have something we call scalable enterprises and that's partly direct investments in in uh, in uh, companies in the manufacturing and and uh, 
uh, agriculture value chain uh, and also partly uh, investments through uh, private equity funds operating in developing countries. Next slide, please. Uh, our geographic focus is uh, uh, relatively concentrated. Uh, we uh, are having uh, our focus on LDCs uh, and on Sub-Saharan Africa, and that's according to our mandate from, from the government. So uh, the, dark, uh, the darkest uh, areas on this map are our priority countries. Uh, where we build uh, investment pipeline and uh, are building deep country expertise. But we can also invest in the other areas that are marked in this map when we go together with uh, selected partners that know those areas uh, thoroughly. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Northern has uh, quite recently uh, established our climate position uh, and uh, that uh, climate position consists of three uh, pillars, uh, resilience, reduction and risk. Uh, and by uh, our, our resilience pillar uh, is based on the fact that the poor and the vulnerable are the most affected by climate change. Uh, and our priority to LDCs and Sub-Saharan Africa and creating jobs in those regions help make these uh, countries and, and people in those countries uh, more resilient to climate change. That's our main uh, approach to, to, to resilience. Uh, economic growth and job creation is important to, to make uh, uh, people in those countries more resilient to, to the climate change that uh, are coming. Uh, the research reduction pillar is uh, a very important pillar for us as we invest uh, heavily in uh, renewable energy. And by investing in, in renewable energy, uh, we help uh, countries avoid emissions and facilitates the transition to a low carbon economy. Uh, and we are also enabling access to clean energy by investing in off-grid system, home solar systems, and, and such, uh, and providers of such uh, such uh, equipment. So, uh, and investing in renewable energy has been a very important part of Northern's uh, activities uh, for the last. 20 years, uh, and if we add all the greenfield investments we have done in renewable energy and calculate the um, CO2 emissions avoided uh, from all those uh, investments that we have uh, financed, uh, we have calculated that the annual uh, reduction is 8 million tons uh, uh, every year from those uh, those uh, those power plants. Uh, the risk part is uh, is an important part. We are now uh, uh, developing a climate risk assessment tool uh, that will be uh, integrated with uh, our general risk assessment tool. Uh, we are running pilots on, on selected projects uh, on uh, uh, this uh, pilot uh, tool uh, to, to collect experience on how we can do this in an efficient way. And we already experienced that uh, addressing the climate risk and discussing the climate risk with the management of the companies that we invest in is uh, very helpful and putting uh, um, emphasis on climate risk issues in, in companies. So, so I think this is also an important part uh, of uh, what we do. Uh, and as we are so lucky that we have uh, Martin on our board, we have also got a lot of uh, good advice and assistance from him in uh, in addressing this this uh, issue. Uh, but we are still on an early stage here. Next slide, please. 
Here's a few key figures for Northland. Our total portfolio uh, is uh, or was uh, by the end of last year approximately 2.8 billion US dollars. And as you see, uh, more than half of that is in Africa, Sub Saharan Africa. Uh, and uh, on, uh, in the middle, the value of our total uh, portfolio is uh, 3.5 billion. And as you see, uh, almost 50% uh, of that is uh, investments in clean energy. Uh, last year, we committed uh, 457 million US dollars in new investments. We have direct investments in 163 companies. And if we calculate the indirect investments through platforms and funds, uh, we come to a number of 900 uh, companies that we have invested in. We have had a pretty good uh, IRR. Uh, uh, on our investments, uh, it's uh, six percent in investment currency. That's mainly in US dollars since uh, Northland's inception uh, in 1997, and nine percent in Norwegian kroner. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is more detailed on the uh, financial returns from from our investments, showing that we have had uh, high and stable uh, returns from the clean energy and uh, the financial investments, the financial institutions investments. Next slide, please. Uh, a large part of our investments in renewable energy are done through what we call investment platforms. Uh, and uh, through strategic partnerships. We have uh, currently two investment platforms in this area. One of them are Globalec, uh, which is an uh, African uh, power uh, company uh, operating in, in several countries in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and uh, produce uh, energy uh, from uh, gas, wind and solar. And this is a, it's, it's a, probably one of the largest uh, energy producing companies in, in Africa. And through this company, we target greenfield investments in Africa. SN Power uh, has been our uh, hydropower platform. It's a company uh, uh, which uh, has uh, hydropower uh, plants in, in, in several countries, uh, both in Africa and, and Asia and in Central America. Uh, I come a bit back to that, uh, but we have also a strategic partnership with a company called Skatex Solar, that's a stock listed company in, uh, in uh, Norway, uh, which has specialized on building and operating uh, solar power plants in developing countries. Uh, and we have done many uh, co-investments with that company, uh, particularly in Africa, but also other, other places. Um, we have a strategic partnership with KLP, that's the largest Norwegian pension uh, uh, insurance company. Uh, uh, that's a co-investment uh, uh, agreement where, where they uh, can co-invest in our renewable uh, projects, uh, and they have uh, they are one of the very few institutional investors in Norway that really has made investments, direct investments in in renewable energy in developing countries. And we have quite recently, earlier this year, entered into a strategic partnership with NL, Green Power. Uh, it's a partnership uh, to finance, build and operate new renewable projects in India. And that's uh, only a few months since we went into that uh, partnership, but we have uh, large expectation to what we can get out of that. Uh, what happened uh, uh, three weeks ago was that uh, we sold, we exited SN Power, or most of SN Power, 
uh, sold it to Scott XLR, our strategic partner. So if you go to the next slide, um, it's the headline from the press release uh, from 16th of October that Northern sells SN Power to Scott XLR. And by that, we have mobilized more than 1 billion US dollars uh, for new investment in developing countries. And most of that, those investments will be in renewable energy. And, and Scott XLR, a stock listed company, will take uh, SN Power uh, further. They changed the name from, they leave the Solar name because they now are a, um, a, a both solar and hydropower uh, company. And, and we'll also invest in wind power, so they'll be a renewable company. And after this transaction, uh, they raised uh, uh, almost half this uh, amount of more than $1 billion from the Norwegian uh, stock market for financing this deal. So it's a really big deal and we are very uh, satisfied by uh, uh, have been able to, to, to do that and showing that uh, uh, renewable investments in developing countries can be really profitable. Next slide, please. Uh, following this deal uh, selling uh, SN Power, uh, we will still be part uh, of a partnership for hydropower in Africa together with uh, Scott Exular. Uh, we will keep 49% uh, uh, of the projects going on in Africa, in uh, Uganda, Rwanda, DRC, Burundi and Madagascar and also other uh, projects that are in, in pipeline. Um, we also keep, uh, keep holding in, in um, in uh, two power plants in Zambia. Next slide, please. So I think this is the last uh, slide uh, showing the what we call the development effects from our investments. We measure the development effects uh, every year. Uh, and the most important in this respect is uh, on the bottom left uh, showing that uh, the power plants in our portfolio by the end of last year produced 17.2 uh, uh, terawatt hours electricity uh, in 2019 and the portfolio at that time uh, pro uh, avoided or contributed to avoiding 4.6 million tons uh, in, in 2019 of CO2. So uh, that was uh, the highlights from my presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ola, and great to learn more about uh, Northern's perspective, the mandated allocation in Africa you mentioned. You, you addressed resilience as well in your climate strategy, focusing on economic growth and job creation. Interesting because in the next presentation from Isabel, we'll also focus more on opportunities as we've only been addressing risk so far. Uh, you mentioned the climate risk assessment tool, which is in the early days, but that you are developing internally uh, involvement in different investment platforms, the hydropower case by uh, Skatec, uh, very interesting. And, and here are the metrics, the impact metrics, uh, for example, uh, CO2 that was avoided. Um, looking at the time, I suggest we uh, move on directly with uh, Isabel's presentation for now and uh, make sure that we have enough space for the Q&A at the end. Therefore, so may I ask you, Ola, to turn off your camera and Isabel, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so good morning to everybody and greetings from Helsinki. Uh, it is a pleasure to be part of this discussion forum. So thanks to Gaia and Salpo for the kind invitation and to participate in this webinar that really touches upon a topic that is of great importance to NDF. So I will first run quickly through a general presentation of NDF, as I am sure that most of you know us already, and then I will continue to present some specific examples of NDF's work in the field of climate risk adaptation and resilience. So next, next slide, please. 
so NDF is the joint Nordic climate and development finance institution owned by Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden. And while NDF was established over 30 years ago, for the past 10 years, NDF's mandate has been to finance climate mitigation and adaptation projects in low-income countries. Next slide, please. NDF's current uh, portfolio consists of around 120 climate projects in developing countries with total commitments amounting to over 400 million euro. Uh, the portfolio is diversified globally with over 50% of commitment allocated to Sub-Saharan Africa. And in line with NDF's mandate of providing concessional and catalytic financing, NDF's portfolio consists of over 50% of grant financing, and 25% of equity investments, and the remaining commitments are concessional loans and recoverable grants. Next slide, please. As many of you already most probably know, the Nordic government announced last week a 350 million euro recapitalization to NDF to solidify the shared commitment of the Nordic governments to build back better and greener in a global post-pandemic recovery in developing countries. Uh, in this context, NDF's new strategy, which, which was launched last spring, is designed to deliver Nordic values and much needed finance to fight climate change in developing countries. The main pillars of the new strategy is to work proactively in the nexus between climate and development. And we do this by focusing on lower income countries and countries in fragile situations, and by continuing to provide agile and flexible concessionary financing and always by highlighting Nordic priorities and Nordic leadership in all activities. Next slide, please. Uh, through the combination of, of NDF's vast experience in climate finance and the strength and mandate and support that we have received from, from the Nordic governments, we see that NDF is well positioned to continue providing catalytic and impactful financing in key areas such as addressing climate risks and strengthening the adaptation capacity and climate resilience of developing countries. Next slide, please. So as mentioned earlier, the topic of climate risks and climate resilience and adaptation have been an important part of NDF's activities during the past years. While NDF's portfolio includes significant activities also in the public sector, and we have a number of public sector adaptation and resilience projects, for the purpose of this session, I will focus on our private sector activities. So next slide, please. Uh, one of NDF's first ventures focusing on private sector climate resilience is the ProAdapt program which was launched in 2013 together with the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, so the main objective of ProAdapt has been, been to build climate resilience in micro, small and medium-sized enterprises in Latin America by finding different solutions that can potentially turn climate risks into business opportunities. So the activities of ProAdapt were originally based on the idea that while climate change creates significant risks to economies and societies, private sector companies are well positioned to provide solutions that address these climate risks. So in addition, these solutions uh, can potentially generate positive investment returns and bring new business areas to developing countries and markets, of course. So as a result, uh, during these years, the product portfolio uh, consists of various projects in multiple countries and in activities ranging from climate smart agriculture, early warning weather systems, circular economy models, and climate resilient infrastructure, among others. Next slide, please. Uh, an important part of, of ProAdapt has been the creation of the, and dissemination of knowledge relating to private sector resilience and adaptation. And in this context, a number of knowledge products and toolkits have been developed 
the flagship report of ProAdapt, the, the Private Markets for Climate Resilience, was published last summer. And the focus of the PMCR study was on how climate resilience solutions provided by the private sector are addressing climate risks in the agriculture and transportation sector in six developing countries. Other key product toolkits that have been developed include uh, climate risk assessment tools for financial institutions and supply chains and the gender toolkit that can be used to mainstream gender in resilience and adaptation projects. Next slide, please. Uh, so following the lessons learned from ProAdapt, NDF was well positioned to provide catalytic and critical early stage support to the first global private equity fund focusing strategically and specifically in climate resilience solutions, the Lightsmith Climate Resilience Partners. Uh, the fund invests in growth stage companies whose products and services help address the effects of climate change. Uh, based on the understanding that many of these products and services already exist in global markets, the fund's strategic focus is on transferring adaptation and resilience technologies to developing countries where climate vulnerability is at the highest. So in line with the main trends in climate finance, the fund has a blended structure that accommodates both concessional and, and commercial investors and we successfully reached a first closing with well-known leading institutions back in December 2019. And we are targeting to a final closing in mid to 2021. Next slide, please. So as part of a thorough mapping of the potential market, private market for adaptation and resilience solutions, uh, Lightsmith has worked with the underlying assumption that there are companies, both in developed and developing countries, with existing technologies and services that can help to assess and address the physical climate risks and impacts increased by climate change. These companies are divided into two categories. They are companies with climate intelligence for identifying and assessing physical, physical climate risks, and companies who, with products and services addressing physical climate risks. Next slide, please. The six identified key subsectors in the market, in the private market of climate resilience, include agricultural analytics, supply chain analytics, catastrophe risk modeling, geospatial mapping, water technologies and food system. And within these sectors, Lightsmith has developed and built a robust pipeline of potential investments. And the fund's first investments in a water harvesting technology company was recently completed successfully. Next slide, please. So lastly, I want to bring to your attention the Adaptation SME Accelerator Program, which is led by the Lightsmith Group. And it is a joint project with IDB, ProAdapt, and the Global Environment Facility. So the objective of ASAP is to identify and engage developing country SMEs and investors in adaptation and climate resilience action. As the first deliverable of, of the ASAP project, the Adaptation Solutions ta Taxonomy was launched in September 2020. And the, the taxonomy serves as a practical tool to identify adaptation companies and to also address their challenges and needs to upscale resilience businesses. The taxonomy also sets a benchmark of indicators that can be used to track and evaluate adaptation and resilience impact in all types of SMEs operating in the field. Next slide, please. So uh, this is very, very short, this is all from me. So uh, thank you for your time. And in case you want to continue the discussion on NDF's work on climate resilience and adaptation, please do not, not hesitate to contact me directly. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Isabel. And you know, looking at the time, I think we, uh, we have time for another question. Uh, happy to hear the 350 million of recapitalization uh, by uh, the Nordic governments. 
the, your, your work with ongoing partners, the risk tool you've been developing both for financial institutions as well for supply chains, uh, focusing on resilience, private market for adaptation and solutions, uh, some, some very useful and practical examples as well for uh, the listeners. The, the business lines or you mentioned, such as agricultural or supply chain uh, intelligence or uh, other products that address uh, climate risk that are uh, an interesting investable option for uh, for NDF. And then the taxonomy for uh, what, what type of uh, business model uh, is uh, adaptation centric. Uh, yes, so now very useful. Uh, Miko, looking at you for a moment uh, and looking at the questions coming in, uh, do you have one question for Isabel before we go to the group? Q&A. Thank you. Maybe an easy one to start with. So, so how do you see, Isabel, the overall market understanding awareness of adaptation solutions evolving? It's, it's something, it's a new kind of market. Uh, there are few actors and you are one of the forerunners in, in looking at it and developing it and engaging investors into it. How do you see that it could evolve during the next couple of years? It has been hard work to get it where it is now, but uh, you see that it could be catalyzing and growing fast, also taking note of the accelerating climate impacts. Thank you, Miko. Thank you for the very good question. Uh, it, well, I think that it, we can all agree that the awareness on, on adaptation and resilience have really increased during the past year or two years. So, and the, really the, the, the speed of this awareness increase is also is, is, is becoming faster. And I do think that it, it also it, it is well linked to the fact that as as the world and as policymakers and institutions, investors and companies are realizing that climate impacts are taking place now already. And the fact that this is that these are are becoming worse constantly and it and the and the outlook, the, the projections are really, really, really somber. So I do think that there is that that first move and movement has already is already taking place very well so i think that what one of many, many of the bottlenecks that at ndf we are trying to solve is that we really want to our focus is to bring that if that awareness to a higher place but also proactively with this additional capital that we are receiving from our owners is also to to mobilize uh, commercial and institutional investors so in that context we see um, that for example these blended structures pro provide excellent opportunities to to mobilize uh, investments to 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 the most vulnerable countries for example in sub-saharan africa and getting that that commercial and institutional capital there so we as a con concessional uh, investor we are happy to take that that first loss that junior positions uh, having in mind with that the main objective is to get those significant capital flows to developing countries and to adaptation and resilience. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Encouraging to hear, and, and it's true we don't have time to waste. Uh, Ingmar, there are a set of questions coming in. How do you want to proceed? Uh, Guys, just uh, thanks, Miko, and also Isabel for for answering. So looking at uh, the time we have uh, remaining, uh, may I ask you, uh, Nico, Martin, and Ola, to uh, open your cameras as well, so that we go can go to a, a group uh, Q and A. I just wanted to start with uh, one top one and well one point that came in from the speakers, which is an interesting one, regarding our search for uh, what could roles on the governmental level be in helping to facilitate uh, climate as a more tangible, understandable topic, um, uh, especially focusing on perhaps standardization or harmonization of data and scenario analysis, creating clarity among the market. Uh, one of the uh, listeners mentions uh, some European efforts that are ongoing to uh, install a, a European-wide ESG database. Um, reference is being made to the to a European single access point for data. So I think the main point here is this perspective is on the European level. There could be an effort, but maybe if I give the word first to you, uh, Nico, uh, you started the presentation as well, uh, referring to 
uh, an Australian uh, consortium. Um, would you would you mind elaborating a few thoughts on on your view of how uh, you know governments or or multi-stakeholder groups could uh, could play a role in facilitating data, Nico? Sure, happy happy to do that, Ingmar. Um, so the initiative I was uh, referring to is the Climate Measurement Standards Initiative, um, acting in uh, in Australia, and it's really more. It's not like purely governmental-led, right? I mean, there is this is really. I think we heard that already also from the other speakers. It's this this initiative tries to gather together different stakeholders in the overall process, so, right? The government as a facilitator, but then also uh, scientific institutions, um, and then different players from the financial market being users of this type of data, but also, for example, um, provider of, sub, of such data as this different type of cert, uh, service providers. And overall, um, what I, and we are also, for example, part of this, of, of this consultation, I think what's really interesting here is that um, they really go this, additional step not kind of creating uh, a new reporting framework or something but really making more clear what type of data is suitable for which purpose and how should you best report it so that uh, people from the outside also can understand uh, what have been done internally what type of scenarios have been used and can then also for example facilitate this analysis as a financial institution, for example, to incorporate in their own analysis again, because they can really kind of follow along with what has been done um, so far. <laughs> and this also, I think, would help uh, in terms of an important point, I think, that um, Martin made is that this whole exercise is not just a reporting exercise, but it is really for, for uh, your internal purposes. And I think such a standardization and guidance can really help also the, the internal structure so that you know even if you're not an expert in, in climate modeling, you know more or less uh, what you can expect and what data you should use. Thanks so much, Nico. Martin, may I give the floor to you to share a few thoughts? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so I, I, I agree with Nico. Uh, no, number one, uh, we don't need more reporting frameworks. We have good frameworks for this. But I think an important point here is that very many types of businesses will see that there is not just direct climate risk risk to their business models, either from fiscal risk or from transition risk, but there's a lot of indirect risks. They will be hit by climate risks that affect other sectors, other businesses indirectly. Uh, for you know, one, one prime example, of course, is uh, the whole banking sector which is almost only uh, indirect in the sense that the risks of the banking sector is really a reflection of risks in the overall economy to a large extent. Um, so I think it would be useful for uh, governments to think about how they can have add more sort of transparency around overall risks for society. Norway is of course a, a special case in the sense in the Nordic region because of the uh, uh, fossil fuel industry, so the transition risk issues are, will play out a bit differently. Um, but I think uh, for uh, you know uh, we and I I was headed I headed a couple of years ago a, a government a commission uh, set up to give recommendations on climate risks for the Norwegian economy, and we actually recommended that the that the uh, government use the TCFD framework. For itself as well, and government can actually use the TCFD framework and report uh, on both how they manage risk, but also uh, metrics and also stress testing. And so, making sure that we understand more of the macroeconomic uh, consequences of alternative scenarios for transition, for instance, because that will feed into general business risk for both investors and corporates. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, what about uh, Ola? A few thoughts from your side. How could uh, Nordic governments, governments in general, play a role here? Uh, well, I think uh, on the uh, reporting side, I agree with what has already been said. Uh, there are not 
not uh, large need for uh, more reporting uh, uh, systems. And also mentioned that we, uh, as a DFI, uh, um, work with the other DFIs, the other Nordic DFIs and the other European DFIs and the MDBs, the multilateral banks, uh, on developing uh, standards for reporting and uh, methodology for, for calculating uh, emissions avoided and such things. Uh, and, and, um, and we do a lot of work uh, on that. Um, so I think that's well taken, taken care of. Um, uh, but when you ask what is the most important thing that the governments can do, uh, my answer is uh, more funding, uh, funding investments, because the, the, the financing needs for uh, particularly renewable uh, energy uh, in developing countries are huge. And we could, uh, I'm sure we could uh, over not very long time more than double our uh, our um, activities in that respect and that could also other DFIs and DFIs are very well um, positioned to make that sort of investments because they have pipeline, they have uh, networks in the developing countries where those investments are needed. So that's my reply. Uh, that's the most important thing governments can do. Thanks Ola. More funding, more funding, more funding. Isabel, what's your, what's your take? Thank you. I, I, I really don't have much to add because, as I, as I said, I, I agree that more funding and, uh, and of course, we are, we are at NDF, we are in this very happy position at the moment. So, but those are, of course, the, the right ways. And, and the, the funding solutions also need to be, need to really tackle the entire market and, and, and really, so in that sense, yeah. But I agree with all the previous comments. Thanks, Isabel. Maybe going back to you, uh, Martin, looking at how governments could make this practical. You, you mentioned in your previous advisory committee, you, you, you came to the recommendation that incorporating TCFD is a useful step. How could a government practically do that? Is that could they do this through a promotional campaign? Is this to be within certain formal recommendations? Could you say a few words on, on how they could practically do that? Well, I, so two different aspects of this. One is what the government does for itself. And that's more a question of policy and how you describe climate risk in policy documents like budget documents and, you know, and uh, how um, regulators, uh, et cetera, work on this. And there's a lot of work now going on in the regulatory system also, the so-called network for greening of the financial system, which has uh, you know, the, the financial market supervisors in, and central banks in very many countries, I think over 50 countries now. And so they are working on understanding climate risk for the financial system from that sort of regulatory perspective. Uh, but then there is the thing, so these are, you know, government activities in the sense and understanding and sharing uh, the, their understanding of possible climate related stress and risk to the broader society. But then there is more the regulatory pathway of encouraging disclosures around uh, these types of, uh, of risks. So um, obviously there is a, a legal, uh, in the European Union, uh, you know, on the taxonomy uh, and uh, the non-financial reporting directive, um, these things were now in the government, the Ministry of Finance in Norway sent on a public consultation uh, last week uh, proposals for a law on non-financial disclosures that would implement these EU directives in Norwegian law as well. So I think that's sort of the regulatory approach around disclosure requirements for, uh, for corporates and for the private sector, which is sort of a parallel approach to the government doing more work on understanding how these climate risks could affect society at large, the financial system, and then sharing that insight with um, with the uh, participants in financial markets. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, that's a clear answer. Miko, looking at you and looking at uh, a few minutes we have left, um, anything else from the audience or from your perspective you'd like to share? Maybe 
one concluding question is that how do you see the work the kind of work that Pro, ProAdapt and NDF has been doing is looking at the market opportunities also that part of the site. So we've been discussing a lot about the management of risk, kind of a defensive approach, but the market is there even if we do have some challenges in identifying and, and, and it's maybe not that visual yet, but how could we help that market field evolve? Uh, Isabel, do you have any recommendations for, for the finance sector how to help build the pipeline, how to make them bankable, those kinds of investments so that we could get into a growing uh, growing market and not only speak about the defensive side of, of managing climate risks. Thank you. Thank you, Mika, for that question. I, I, I think that all it, well, there is a lot of uh, awareness and knowledge to be built uh, on the on the policy side and uh, government side and investor side, there is also a lot to do on the on the business side, so companies. So one of, for example, with the Lightsmith Fund with Kraft, uh, one of the main premises is that there are these technologies and these solutions and companies that are already commercially and profitably producing these these solutions and technologies, but they might not call themselves at, as climate resilience and adaptation technologies. So one thing is, of course, framing and then just also just just providing that that catalytic investment and that that hands on support that then companies need to build those those businesses around there. So I would say that that's that's where we are now at this stage, really. And then, of course, mobilization of, of capital and investments and, and and proving that these are profitable investment assets also. Thank you. Maybe just then a follow up to Ula. When you speak with your companies or investees and you have pipeline, do you often have companies proposing to you or partners saying that this investment will help you build resilience, let's say, in addition to the no regret solutions of uh, building good, decent jobs and providing electricity? Do you have that kind of a movement suggestion in your pipeline coming already in? I think uh, in 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 the agribusiness part, uh, the value chain, that's uh, that's an important uh, issue uh, because in in countries where we invest, for example, in East Africa, uh, the 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 growth and uh, flooding uh, has become more uh, heavy than before and and uh, and at another times of the year uh, than before. So 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 companies has to prepare for for such uh, changes and and i think uh, our, many of our clients are very well aware of that the problem is uh, when when you come to our risk uh, tool is to establish a baseline where they tell us that the flooding is uh, common that has been flooding every more or less every year for as long as they can remember and also drought uh, periods are also common so establishing a local uh, relevant locally relevant pipeline is, uh, baseline is is, uh, is is a challenge thank you Ola. back to ingmar thank you well that brings me then to the yeah the concluding remarks and um, a big thank you to uh, Nico, Martin, Ola, and Isabel for uh, for contributing to today's discussion. And this was the uh, the final webinar of the Nordic Platform for Mobilizing Climate Finance. Thank you all for participating. Uh, we've had uh, many of you participating, mostly from uh, the European uh, region and the Asia Pacific region. Uh, if you have any questions on DEX, uh, please reach out to us through the contact details here. We will share the slides with you. Uh, you will be able to watch a recording as well at your convenience. There remains me to say again a big thank you and uh, wishing you all a good day and um, uh, good luck and enjoyment in watching the uh, elections as well in America as they will be unfolding hopefully. So thank you everybody and hope to see you uh, again soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye everyone.